discussing on uh, rotator interval anatomy, pathology of uh, adhesive capsulitis, and imaging findings of adhesive capsulitis on MRI, treatment options, and I will show you the procedure how it is done. So once we go to the rotator in rotator interval anatomy, the contents of rotator interval is long and biceps tendon. Anteriorly, we have the coraco humeral ligament and supraglenohumeral ligament complex and joint capsule. Superiorly, we have the supraspinatus tendon. Inferiorly, we have the subscapularis tendon here. And medially, we have the coracoid process. Laterally, the transverse humeral ligament, which the which is uh, the ligament which holds the biceps tendon in the bicepital groove. Then uh, laterally, we have the transverse humeral ligament. Yeah, that's what. So laterally, we have the transverse humeral ligament. Here we can see uh, this is the rotator interval. So in the rotator interval, if you see the ligaments, like uh, this is the greater tuberosity, this is the lesser tuberosity. So on to towards the lesser tuberosity side, we have this medial band of coracohumeral ligament joining the superior glenohumeral ligament. And laterally, if you see, this is the lateral band of coracohumeral ligament. So in between, there is a long enough biceps tendon which is passing. If you see the cross section here, this is a long enough biceps tendon. This is a transverse humeral ligament. Okay. And here we see this is a lateral band of coracohumeral ligament. This is the medial band of coracohumeral ligament with superior glenohumeral ligament complex. So this is the anatomy, gross anatomy. So if we go to the MR images, so here we can see this is the supraspinatus tendon. Okay. Then as we go, this is the long head of biceps tendon. So if you see the sagittal images, this is the sagittal PDFS image where we can see this is the biceps anchor. This is a long head of this is the biceps anchor. This is the long head of biceps tendon. And this is the rotator interval. Usually the rotator interval is a space between the supraspinatus tendon and the subscapularis tendon. So this is the rotator interval. So as we go here, so this is the long head of biceps tendon and here we can see the coracohumeral ligament. So for the same patient, there was an arthrogram done. So in the arthrogram, we can better see the anatomy. So here we can see, the same thing as we saw in the cross-sectional uh, gross uh, image where uh, this is a long of biceps tendon this is a uh, transverse humeral ligament so if you see here so this part is formed by the medial band of coracohumeral ligament and supraglenohumeral ligament complex this is the lateral band of coracohumeral ligament okay so again if i'm going to the sagittal images on the orthogram Let us see here. This is the coracohumeral ligament. Okay, this is the coracohumeral ligament. This is a long head of biceps tendon. Here you can see the long head of biceps tendon. This is a superior glenohumeral ligament. This is a superior glenohumeral ligament. Then uh, we have this middle glenohumeral ligament and inferior glenohumeral ligament. This inferior glenohumeral ligament, as you know, it is divided into three parts: anterior, middle, and posterior. So this part, we are concerned about this. This is the rotator interval. So what is so important about rotator interval? So the pathology of this adhesive capsulitis starts in the rotator interval. So what is the ideology of uh, adhesive capsulitis? Usually is a multifactorial. It can be a primary or secondary. So primary is idiopathic. So no identifiable cause is there, but associated with systemic conditions like diabetes mellitus, thyroid, cardiovascular disorders, or autoimmune conditions. Secondary, which occurs after trauma or prolonged immobilization, rotatory cuff diseases or cuff tears, calcific tendinitis, stroke, or post-surgery, especially for breast, cardiac, and shoulder. Other associations are also seen in middle-aged women with possible genetic, hormonal, inflammatory, immune factors contributing to it. So if we go to the pathology of adhesive capsulitis, it is usually characterized by chronic inflammation of joint capsule and synovium leading to fibroblastic proliferation. This causes capsular thickening, fibrosis, and contracture. 
especially in the rotator interval and corocohemoral ligament. Usually the adhesive capsulitis starts in the rotator interval and progresses further. Progressive adhesion formation limits the capsular volume and restricts the joint mobility. Overall, it represents a self-limiting fibrosing condition resulting in painful stiffness of the glenohumeral joint. So this is the pathology of adhesive capsulitis. If we go to the imaging findings, what are all the imaging findings we can expect on an MRI of an adhesive capsulitis? Usually increased signal intensity of inferior glenohumeral ligament or thickening of the axillary pouch, usually more than 3 to 4 mm, which shows increased signal intensity of on PDFS images and thickening of corocohumeral ligament, presence of subcorocoid triangle sign or a joint capsule thickening, usually measured anterior joint capsule of more than 3.5 mm. Then soft tissue thickening and signal changes, usually increased PDFS signal intensity in the rotator interval. Soft tissue encasing the biceps anchor, capsular and synovial enhancement in axillary cysts and rotator interval and post contrast images. Contrast enhancement of inferior glenohumeral ligament and rotator interval is more than 90% sensitivity and the specificity for frozen shoulder, okay? Then in chronic cases, usually this is a fibrosing disease. So you will see, you will see a T2 hypointense signal and pericapsular scarring. So these are the usual findings of adhesive capsulitis. So most common finding is usually thickening of uh, soft tissues in the rotator interval with uh, corcohumeral ligament thickening, inflammation in the rotator interval, thickening of the axillary recess or inferior glenohumeral ligament. Here we can see this is the case of uh, adhesive capsulitis where there is thickening of the axillary pouch. Here we can see there is thickening. If I measure it, it's almost like uh, 8.6 mm. And okay, so this is thickening. And also, if we, we can observe that there is increased signal intensity of this on PDFS images. So if I see the sagittal images, yeah, this is a sagittal image, PDFS. We can see this is the long head of biceps tendon in the rotator interval. The surrounding soft tissues in the rotator interval are thickened and show increased signal intensity. The corcohumeral ligament is also thickened. If you see this corcohumeral ligament is also thickened is almost like 6 mm. So this is a case of adhesive capsulitis. What we have to look at in adhesive capsulitis case is like, are there any rotatory cuff tears? Are there any associated uh, cuff pathologies like any tendinitis or is it only an isolated rotatory um, periarthritis shoulder? Because if there are any rotatory cuff tears, then there is every chance the patient will have limited mobility post-procedure and also um, post-procedure the recurrence chances of uh, uh, getting an adhesive capsulitis are more okay so this is all about uh, anatomy of rotator interval pathology and imaging findings on mri so what are all the treatment options usually available in adhesive capsulitis? In adhesive capsulitis, usually uh, in early stages, it is a conservative management with uh, uh, painkillers, muscle relaxants, followed by physiotherapy. So if the patient is not responding to it, then there is, uh, there is uh, like to decrease the inflammation, intra-articular steroid injection usually done. Then like in the, when there is a limit when there is more restricted mobility or decreased movement of the show uh, uh, ball uh, ball and socket joint in some positions then we uh, so hydro distension is hydro distension is done so hydro distension or hydro dilatation of the uh, shoulder joint usually it is done under fluoroscopy or ultrasound guidance so what we do in this is like we inject um, mixture of saline and uh, local anesthetic into the joint and distend the joint capsule beyond its capacity. So by creating, so we are creating a room for the uh, humerus to move around in the sh shoulder joint where the, where the ca joint cap joint capacity has been decreased previously. 
So if the patient is not responding to that, next is manipulation under anesthesia. So then arthroscopic capsular release, then open surgical release, which is rarely done nowadays. Most of the cases usually go till the stage of hydrodilatation. And sometimes under uh, like arthroscopic capsular release. So these are uh, like arthroscopic capsular release is almost like a uh, last resort in the case of adhesive capsulitis. So then here is the procedure. Before any intervention procedure, always take the consent. Then look for the blood parameters, platelet count, bleeding time, clotting time, coagulation profile, and viral, viral screening should be done. If everything is good, then only go to the procedure. So here we see we are loading the NS. I'm taking a 20 cc syringe here. And in that approximately 10 ml normal saline was taken. And then I'm going to mix it with uh, almost uh, 10 ml of 2% uh, lignocaine. Then I'm going to add around 2 ml of 40 mg per ml quinocotton, that is uh, triamcinolonastic. So usually most of the MSK procedures, the my steroid of choice for intraarticular injections especially is triamcinolonacetate. So I had, uh, if you see there, but the, here uh, there is a loaded uh, syringe with uh, whatever is the mixture I have told, that is local and strict 2% uh, LOX, NS and triamcinolonastic loaded into a 20 cc syringe, okay? Approximately 25 ml, of uh, that mixture was loaded, 20 to 25 ml. Then uh, here I'm taking an, another 10 cc syringe, loading it with uh, approximately 8 ml of uh, lignocaine, 2%, and I, I have added uh, 1 ml, 40 mg per ml triamcinolone acetate. So then uh, my both uh, injections are ready. So first of all, I'm here cleaning the area of interest. So uh, usually I approach the shoulder joint and ultrasound in a posterior approach. So I'm cleaning it, then uh, initially with betadine, then followed by spirit. So in this case, most of the cases, I do three injections in uh, uh, periarthritis shoulder. So first thing will be hydrodilatation. So I use a 22 gauge spinal needle here. So uh, posterior approach usually I enter through the infraspinatus uh, tendon. So if you see, this is my probe position, where if I'm putting the probe there, I can see the head of the humerus here, medial uh, and uh, and adjacent to that, I can see the, yeah. So this is the head of the humerus. I'm just adjusting the position. Um, So once I'm there, I'll put the needle into the joint. So uh, here we, ha we have the labrum here, head of the humerus. In between uh, the labrum and head of the humerus, I'll put my needle. So if you see here, my needle is going in. Needle is going in. Yeah, I think you can see the tip of it. Now it's entering into the joint, yeah. So it's in the joint now. You can see here the dicogenic line, that is a needle. Once it is in the position, I'll slowly inject uh, this mixture, which was which I have loaded into the 20 cc syringe. So slowly I do uh, inject it. And uh, I can see that, uh, yeah, the fluid is percolating, the air bubbles you can see here. So, and uh, as it is, yeah, you can see here the needle position, it is exactly like that. So, yeah, um, I'm keeping the, keeping on pushing the injection mixture inside the joint. And I can see the capsule getting distended. Here you can see that fluid is, uh, that capsule is getting uh, distended and fluid is there in the joint. So this is one part. So first thing is hydro distension. So if you see here, most of my injection is getting completed. Almost there is a eight uh, ml left. So I'm pushing that further. So approximately I do give around 
20 to 25 ml okay based on that uh, joint capacity post this hydro distension then i will do a suprascapular narrow block usually uh, i give uh, 5 ml of uh, lignocaine to uh, like uh, 2 percent lignocaine with uh, 20 mg of uh, uh, kinocot in it so here we can see that uh, the, this is the suprascapular notch here so and if you see the needle is uh, i'm putting the needle in in you can see my tip of the needle in the suprascapular notch once i reach the suprascapular notch then i give the suprascapular nerve block yeah then the third uh, thing what i do is i make the patient sit like i have shown you then uh, into the rotator interval if you see this is a rotator interval when i'm seeing an axial view i'll put a needle a small needle of 2.5 centimeters im needle so here you can see i'm putting the needle into the rotator interval <coughs> here you can see the tip of the needle it's now in the rotator interval then i'll inject approximately 4 to 5 ml of the kinocot with the lox mixture here so because rotator interval is the primary pathology of uh, adhesive capsulitis so once uh, i have done injection into the rotator interval then most of my steps are done in the most of the cases post procedure the patient explain, uh, experiences good amount of pain relief almost near 100 percent pain relief with this procedure and uh, a patient is advised to use an ice pack if necessary and uh, avoid from strenuous activities for next one to two days and uh, after one day one to one or two days he can start the physical therapy like uh, more of a uh, uh, physiotherapy of the joint with uh, which includes a lot of mobility so uh, with the procedure and the physiotherapy the patient will recover almost near 200 percent uh, from the frozen shoulder thank you